you for joining us at the very last panel <laughs> of today before we go to demonstration. Uh, here we, want, we would like to talk about the challenges, resilience and strength of trans movements, groups of trans people across Central, Eastern Europe and Central Asia and not only region. And we have an amazing group of activists from different countries of the region also on Zoom with us. Uh, so let's first introduce ourselves quickly and then we'll go to discussion. Okay, um, I guess I, I'm, yeah, I, I start, okay. Um, hello everybody, uh, it's really nice to share this space with you today. Thank you for being here. My name is Kat Jugravu. Um, I'm Romanian Roma, but uh, since 2012 I live in Germany and I have a bit of a um, quarrel with the Romanianness of, of myself. I don't think I identify, but today I will try to offer you a perspective on uh, transgender uh, rights um, in, in the Romanian space. Uh, I am a culture educator, I'm a theater maker, uh, performer, and also the founder of, um, of a company, of a performance company in Berlin. It's called Queer Dose Collective. So yes, thank you Lambda Polska and thank you Monica for having me here today, really. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Mati Hegedus, I'm from uh, Hungary and I represent uh, Budapest Pride, the organization. I'm one of the spokespersons there and uh, I lead our national Pride program project. Um, and today I will be sharing uh, the, the information about uh, trans rights in, in Hungary. Um, yeah, that's that's all. Hi, um, I'm Harvey Rabbit. I am from California, USA, but I have lived in Berlin, Germany for about 12 years. I am a filmmaker. Um, you will soon, I think, be able to see my film, my first feature film, Captain Fagatron Saves the Universe, in um, different parts of Poland. Um, it's being distributed in Poland. And um, I am, uh, I guess I have become kind of an activist for um, queers in Uganda recently. I am always an activist, but I go in and out of politics, I kind of see art and life as activism. I will be talking about um, joy, resilience, comedy, and camp, um, as well as the state of trans rights in the USA and a little bit about Uganda. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elias Moisson. I am from a small city in Belgium, but I study in Ghent, uh, which is like the progressive city of Belgium. Uh, I study social work and through my education I got in contact with Monica uh, because I did my internship at Well Young. Well Young is a LGBTQ youth organization um, for people from 8 till 30 years old. Um, and I am currently writing my bachelor's thesis on the relevance of social work in career spaces and how we can still develop, even though legally we have our rights, we don't necessarily have social rights. So that's what I'm going to be talking about right now. Um, my name is Siri and I'm Siberian Polish and I'll show you the situation of transgender people in Russia today. So. You can keep the mic. Like, it will be useful. So, Levan, Anita, Vincent, uh, also, like, we would like you to introduce yourselves. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. I represent GATE, which is Global Action for Trans Equality. And first of all, I wanted to thank you, the organizers, for organizing such an amazing event. And I was really happy that GATE was able to um, support this initiative. Um, my, I, my work predominantly is focused on anti-gender movements and how anti-gender movements impact the lives of trans and gender diverse communities. And my presentation will also be about that, but I, it will be focused on Central Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Thank you. Anita? They them pronouns, sorry. 
just a final note. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Anita. I represent the Trans Coalition here. We work on the Caucasus, Eastern East Europe, and Central Asia region. And I am going to talk about the situation in the region and the influence of Russia on it. And Vincent, do you want to say hello? Yeah, of course. Uh, hello, my name is Vincent Tulankin. I'm from Russia, from Yekaterinburg city. And after the beginning of Russia full scale uh, into Ukraine, I left the country, my country, and uh, continue my activism here uh, in beautiful Kyrgyzstan, in beautiful Bishkek city. Here, yeah, I represent the Trans Coalition. We work in uh, Central Asia and uh, Eastern Europe. As uh, Anita said, um, we, uh, my, with my colleague, uh, we sh will share uh, the situation in our region and uh, about the best practice in supporting trans activists and a little historical overview and uh, trends that we see here. Uh, I'm sorry for my English. Uh, I don't speak English. And so our report will be represented by Anita. Thank you. From what I hear, you speak amazing English. So uh, that's not true. Uh, and last but not least, we have Alexia with us. If you'd like to introduce quickly yourself. Yeah, just uh, hi. So my name is Alexia and I'm from Eastern Ukraine. Uh, also, I'm a, an active soldier in the United, in the Ukrainian army. So that's, that would be it. Uh, and uh, a co-founder of T-Kids organization for, uh, which helps, uh, you know, trans teenagers in the south and eastern parts of Ukraine. And it's the only organization of such type in Ukraine. Uh, I mean, for which helps, I mean, trans children. So that that would be short. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. So uh, without further ado, uh, Levan, if you'd like to share with us a quick overview of, because we need to learn about it and we need to learn about how anti-gender movements work, what are their strategies, how do they impact the work of uh, activism in the region. So Levan, the floor is yours uh, to talk about it. Now. Yes. Thank you, Claude. Am I, um, is it possible for me to share my screen to show the presentation? Or is it you who is going to administer that or how, how do we? Yeah, proceed? like, let's try. You should be. Uh, cause it, when I press share screen, it says, um, it's been disabled. Okay. Wukash, can you, uh, give the host to Levan quickly so they can share the screen? Are we able to? Okay. Now okay. Yeah. Okay. And so, just a second. So, can you see my screen in a full screen the way it's supposed to? Yeah. We Hello? see. It. Yeah. Yeah. We see everything. Yes, so I know I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just, tr I will try to go because there's so many issues to um, dive into. So I'm tr I will try to be as, as fast as possible. So basically, just an, a very quick overview about GATE. So GATE is the only international trans and gender diverse and intersex led organization that works on the human rights and justice for transgender diverse and intersex communities. So we work on global level. We do partner with national level or regional organizations, but our main advocacy avenue is the international level, which is most of the times international institutions such as the UN or other international bodies. So basically, um, I will not, again, I will not go into a lot of details because I know we'll have a question and answer um, section at the end. So if there are any questions, feel free to ask me then. So I will just give you an overview of some of the findings that we um, had through our survey, which was held in last year and, and we started in summer. 
which and, and the survey was open all the way till um, um, September, I think. And then we were um, analyzing some data. And what I'm going to present is part of a larger study, which was a global one. And I took out the part which was focused on Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And to be honest, we haven't, we were not really able to reach uh, all of the countries everywhere in the um, in the region. Um, so the countries that I will be talking about um, is our Armenia, Bulgaria, Croatia, Estonia, and Georgia, and Kazakhstan, Montenegro, Romania, Russia, Serbia, and Tajikistan. Um, I hope that in, in the next year um, um, or in the upcoming studies, we'll be able to reach more activists to gather information about their countries and um, their contexts. So basically, this larger report can be found on Gates' webpage, uh, which I will, the Gates' webpage will be um, shown at the end of the slide. So basically, some of the main findings that we saw that the activists, trans activists, most of the times so are reporting from the region is that we see that in a lot of uh, geographical contexts in the region, um, governments rarely investigating crimes committed by anti-gender actors is one of the most important and most like uh, boiling um, issues that um, activists face. And so we see that in a lot of contexts, in a lot of situations when anti-gender groups are um, planning or executing some violent actions, Government is not usually the police, usually is not really doing much. So this is basically a green light for a lot of anti-gender movements to commit further violence and aggression towards vulnerable, vulnerable groups, uh, out of which trans and gender diverse communities are at the forefront of, of those attacks. This can be partially expa explained by the fact that um, in a lot of contexts, Anti-gender uh, actors are in the government, so we see that there are a lot of anti-gender actors who are on very high level of, um, of po political representation and political power, being the ministers, MPs, or other high-level decision-making um, uh, uh, bodies. And in, in some cases, anti-gender anti actors are government representatives themselves. And one of the most illustrative examples of this um, of this is Russia, and Russia is one of those countries who is who has been um, coming up with a, a lot of anti gender um, ideology and in exporting that from from its country to all the other countries surrounding it, and actually financing um, a lot of anti gender actors and anti gender anti gender ideologies and fake news related to anti gender sentiments. Um, in the region and elsewhere, not only in the Central Asia and Eastern Europe region, but also elsewhere, but a lot of the focus is on that region. In a lot of uh, geographical contexts in the EECA region, we also saw that governments and anti-gender actors have coordinate, coordinated communication and are supported by financial resources coming from the government. So for example, I am from Georgia, and in Georgia, what we see, that it's not official, it's not that out, outright and in our face. But what we see is that usually government not only green lights anti-gender movements when they're um, doing, when they're um, executing some violent actions, for example, the planning violent demonstrations against pride or, or feminist um, uh, demonstration, demonstrators or anything of that sort. But there also, we saw that there are, there are different studies that show that they have um, common business ties, common business interests. Uh, they're never fine when they're not paying taxes and many other things. They're like, they're taking photos with each other. And, and usually they show up in, in situations when the government needs to um, re redirect the attention on some of the failures that government has done. And usually these, um, these anti-gender, these far-right groups are usually very um, supportive of government official narratives in Georgia. And this in, it might be not exactly the same in other countries in the region, but I'm assuming there are a lot of similarities in, in uh, the rest of the countries. Um, so we also know that in a lot of geographical contexts, anti-gender actors are represented as political parties and they have electable um, and they have seats in the electable uh, bodies such as parliaments. And while we, um, our intuition 
was uh, telling us that it will mostly be um, right wing um, ideological stances that anti gender groups are um, are using. We also saw that in a lot of um, contexts, there um, some anti gender groups are not necessarily far right groups. They might have a mixture of different ideologies stemming starting from extreme far to extreme um, right, or sometimes even a mixture of of the both. Um, yeah. So basically, what we also saw is that it is, and this is not very different from other regions, but um, Western ideas and family values are some of the most used focus issues, or like um, talking points for anti-gender groups in this region. So we we are seeing that in a lot of geographical context, um, LGBT and especially trans and gender diverse identities and, and rights are posited as something that West is imposing on the rest of the world, including the EECA region. And it's going against the Christian traditional family values that have already always existed in, in this region. And the West is trying to corrupt this, um, this value, right? They're also using ch uh, sex education and children. So protecting children from morally corrupt ideologies that might incite them to do immoral sexual acts. And this is a very easy point for them to monger fear among among um, society and especially parents and teachers. And um, gender slash LGBTI ideology is also one of the issues that they are trying to depict as this as an ideology that is being imported from the West, and it's not um, as if different human groups have different. Um, position in the social hierarchy and this need to be corrected with human rights is it's posited as just as this gender ideology that is trying to change everyone's opinion and understanding and and just destroy the existing norms and cultures and the way of life and and um Levan, and, and, yes, sorry and, yes. we'll need to speed it up <laughs> Uh, yes, sorry. So you... And so, as we see, it's not only LGBTQI people that are targeted by um, um, anti-gender groups, but it's also other groups that you can see here that it's also ethnic and racial minorities, migrants, cis women, and um, other um, vulnerable groups. So just to have a quick uh, sense of how they're impacting, impacting um, trans and gender diverse activists, is we saw that while a lot of people do not really know whether they have um, ex um engaged in violence. Also, a lot of um, respondents said that they have in the past year in, engaged in violence, and that encompasses verbal violence that is that might be happening on the street, but also online, but also um, on, on internet. But also like the direct physical attacks that, are, that might be happening at the offices or some kind of demonstrations that trans and gender diverse activists or white LGBTQI community might be planning. And some of the th some of the most important things that they have been able to impact is the ability to shape political decisions and impact policies and grow in terms of the number of people supporting them on social media. So how many people are engaging with them on social media, how many people like their posts or, or write their comments, as well as how many people participate in their in-person events. And they're growing in funding and political connections in the past year. So in this situation, a lot of activists think that in the past year, this human rights situation for TGD groups has been worsening. And this is not a surprise because the anti-gender actions and, and the scale of those actions and their funding and ability to impact um, environment is growing. And this is also very common in, in um, a lot of other regions. Number one thing that uh, activists are saying that has been impact that has been impacted by anti-gender opposition is their psycho-emotional uh, well-being and and internal conflicts that are happening due to that. But also a lot of activists feel that they have limited opportunities to involve allies in in activities, fewer advocacy opportunities, and ability to reach decision makers. Sometimes their um, operations are becoming more difficult or legally constraining, and they have to change registration, um, uh, like for formal registration documents or things of that sort. 
there have been issues, um, situations where um, activists needed to cancel the events or um, they needed to um, relocate their staff. Um, and they also face a lot of um, um, limitations in terms of access to funds to plan their activities. And so the last part before I finish is the is about the role of the media. As you can see, um, most of the anti-gender narratives and actions are flourishing and happening on the social media and the social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, for example, which are listed as one of the most used social media channels by anti-gender actors, uh, have become one of the largest media platforms and more, like the biggest source of information for a lot of people. And despite this, they're not really abiding with by the community safety rules that they have in, in their um, embedded in their social media policies, and they're not enforcing them. And this is why we see, this is the last slide, I know I'm a bit over the time. We see that a lot of um, trans activists are saying that um, social media platforms are the primary means where anti-gender mobilization is happening, and they're not enforcing their rules to prevent these harmful and fake news from spreading. So basically, social media platforms are profiteering from the hate being spread about us. So basically, this is Gates' um, um, webpage. You can go there and see the full report, and you can also engage with us in on these different social media uh, platforms. And if you have questions, feel free to ask me at the end of the um, when the Q and A um, section will be opened. And you can we're more than welcome to go and see our webpage and see the full reports there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for for sharing this overview. I hope I was not too over my time. <laughs> Uh, we'll squeeze and we squeeze. I would like now to ask Alexia uh, to to share like your work, what you're doing. Uh, it's so important, especially currently, uh, to support trans kids and also your experience of of working in trans communities. Alexia, I hope you're still with us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. So um, yeah, um, the problem. I, you know, we've encountered when uh, just starting our work is that uh, many trans children don't have any support from parents, sadly, because of the, well, you know, what Levan said, and uh, because of the yeah, social media and so on. So there is an organization in Ukraine called Tergo or something, I may not be sorry for spelling or, or well, it helps. I mean, LGBT children to, you know, have their, find their place and to have peace with both. But with trans kids, it's so much different because we've had different requests, uh, medication like HRT, well, you know, stuff, the pills and uh, blockaders and, uh, and uh, helping with papers, helping with parents, helping just with money. So we've actually covered everything. And uh, without, you know, any, we didn't make any profit. We don't make any profit, you know, but just uh, helped uh, many different children from mostly Eastern regions because it's where I live. Um, so about like like that. So um, maybe could you uh, a bit uh, precise the question? Uh, because in, in general, that's it. Sure. So... Uh... Like, yeah. what support do you receive and what support do you give in the community that, if you're able now, like, uh, supporting? Um, well, we helped, uh, for example, uh, at the beginning of 2022, you know, when the Great War started. Well, this is what they call it here. Uh, um, so, uh, basically... Um, Many trans people and including trans children couldn't, you know, uh, move west uh, because of the new laws that uh, men are not allowed to leave the country. Well, you've heard about it, you've read about it, I'm not going to add anymore. So basically, every human being with male passport or with male ID couldn't leave the country, and uh, this is how we help children uh, because uh, children are kind of allowed to leave the country but there's so much issues with misgendering and one of you know a kid from Zaporizhia my uh, region got attacked by his parents on the 
train station and so on and so much and this is where we helped a lot uh, some kids are not actually kids because they're like youth now they are older than 18 years so they cannot live without help and this is where we helped as well um so uh basically sneaking people out of the country yeah that's that sounds may that may sound illegal but after all i don't give a fuck seriously so um this is what we do we help with money when kids ask us for like you know food and stuff like that because yeah i know it sounds terrible but uh, sometimes we get requests about like basic stuff like food and shit and uh so it's pretty rough here, at least in the east. I don't know about western parts of Ukraine. I don't live there. I don't know about capital much, sorry. But we try to help everyone who asks for help. It's also help with papers because in 2022, well, just in short, let's, I don't want to speak much. So in short, um, getting, you know, changing your papers, your legal documents, IDs, to the required gender was really pain in the ass uh, before 2022 but in 2022 they've stopped it completely well because you know why because they were saying that uh, we are not issuing the diagnosis and not helping with papers because you may use your trans status to leave the country and so on so yeah some kids actually you know texted me uh, like what do I do now I cannot go to the psychiatrist I mean I, they can go but what's the point nobody's going to give them the F64 or something like that yeah F64 then 18B and so on so anyway yeah we tried to help with that but now it's better it's so much better in 2023 it's now they issued the F64 again so now it's possible to change the legal papers of course you need to pay some bribes because that's ukraine and uh but that's not much like in uh, euros it would be 100 euros maybe 200 euros tops you pay and uh kind of to hospital it's like you know voluntary stuff you paid and uh you're getting your f64 after like two weeks maximum months of just waiting so that's not a big deal now. And now moving out of Ukraine is easier, way easier. So uh, now I would say I we don't sneak anyone out because there is no need for it. And uh, as for money, we, well, nobody has requested for food for a long time now. So, I mean, now it's okay, I guess. Yeah, children and the youth still have some issues and like uh, mostly with locals uh, because in some parts of the country like ukraine you had real issues when you don't have pass you know you don't you don't have passing or you look about it you know too queer for people you're getting attacked by just random people on the street and this happens this happens quite a lot i don't know about western ukraine or central ukraine but in the east where it's already like you know a really hot zone because of the war people are a bit you know crazy and doing crazy stuff like that's basically transphobia in real life yeah so now the situation is way better way better for you know trans people in general it's not as bad as it was so that's kind of like that maybe you have other questions or uh, yeah Thank you so much for your work and like I would just like to applaud you. Oh, thank you. For for what you're doing. Thank you. All the support that you're that you're giving and maybe we'll ask you later like we'll share the links like how we can support also your work. And now let's move to the room, the physical room where we are. Uh with Mate, could you quickly tell us like about the uh challenges that uh, Hungarian queer community, trans community faces now uh, and like what you're doing also in your uh, collective care work supporting each other. Yes, so um, in Hungary um, before section 33 legal gender recognition was available for trans and intersex people. Uh, it was regulated by different laws and resolutions, resolutions, sorry. Um, 
so it wasn't a, a clear uh, procedure. Um, you needed three professional opinion, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and a gynecologist or urologist. Um, and it was uh, said by the Constitutional Court that based on human dignity and, and uh, rights to privacy, that you, you have the right to, to change your legal gender and, and your name. Um, medical transitioning wasn't a requirement to do this uh, process and uh, divorce was something that was required to to change your gender. 10% um, of the, the, the costs were covered by the, the health insurance, um, but there was no training for uh, health professionals. Um, so during the 2000s, early 2000s, it, it was possible. And uh, in 2020, during the, the COVID pandemic, uh, this section 33 was introduced in, in the Hungarian parliament. And because of, uh, of the majority of, uh, of Fidesz in, in the Hungarian parliament, uh, it was voted uh, in. And this is banning uh, legal gender recognition for trans and intersex people. Uh, we, Budapest Pride, had a, a protest during uh, the pandemic. So it was an interesting uh, protest. Um, we had a lot of limitations. So it was a small group of people. And trans people were burning their um, birth certificates. It was a copy because you can be fined to <laughs> destroy these papers. Um, and this year in February, uh, the Constitutional Court um, ruled against their earlier decision and it's still impossible to, to change your legal gender. Um, so now uh, another Hungarian uh, LGBTQ organization, Hatir Society, is taking, looking for legal cases, people who would like to change their gender and name, and they are taking uh, these cases to the European uh, Court of Human Rights. Um, you might heard about uh, the infringement procedure that Hungary is, uh, that is tar targeting a, a different Hungarian law, from 2021, which is censoring uh, education and, and uh, the media representation of LGBTQ people. So currently, um, we can only depend on, on the, the human right, the, the European Court of, of Human Rights. And, um, and honestly, it's, it's not uh, uh, like it's, it's hard to be optimistic about this situation. Um, I thought about one case that maybe shows the, the surreality of the, the situation. We have a volunteer who has a dual citizenship. Um, so they are both uh, Ukrainian and Hungarian. And in their Ukrainian papers, they are male um, as their chosen gender. And in their Hungarian paper, it's, it's still female and they cannot change it. Um, and I, I can also share you share with you my, my brother's story. Um, he changed uh, his female name to, to a less female sounding name um, because of the, the stress that we, he felt uh, during like um, visit at the doctor's office or, or in high school. And um, he was also um, kind of like molested on, on the street, just people trying to find out if he's a boy or a girl. And I think that's because of the the enormous fear mongering that our government is doing. Um, I think a, a lot of issues were listed in the beginning. So we have a limited access of free media in Hungary. Most of it is owned um, like media owned by oligarchs, friends of Fidesz. Uh, and this makes it really hard to, to just get our message across. And uh, with the majority in the parliament, it's, it's impossible to uh, uh, do anything in, in the politics. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And Kat, would you like to go next and briefly say about the... Uh, mm, yes, I Romania? mean, uh, we are neighbors, our countries are neighboring, so uh, um, it would make sense that some of the illiberal thoughts and politics are slowly starting to spill into uh, Romanian 
thought Romanian uh, politics, um, but also I look in the room and everybody seems so concerned and, and sad and um, I just want to say before, yes, the situation is really shit, especially in Central, Eastern, European and Central Asian countries, but also there is beauty, there is resistance, the work that you do, for example, with Budapest Pride, which was massive, by the way, the last Pride, how many people were there? 35,000 people in a... In an Eastern European country, I know uh, Hungarians don't enjoy being called Eastern Europeans, but uh, um, you know that's that's a massive effort and uh, and and a message of of hope. Um, the situation in Romania, um, although similar in certain perspectives and mostly through like the political pressure to, to change whatever is ambiguous in the legislation that would not allow us to achieve legal gender recognition, it is a bit different. You were saying something, uh, uh, before 2019, you needed the attest of three, um, specialized medical bodies. Uh, it was the gynecologist, uh, slash um, urologist, urologist um, psychiatrist, and um, psychologist. Um, in Romania, you only need two attests, uh, which is endo yes, endocrinologist. Um, but before that, you need um, the psychiatrist attest, right? They first they need to make sure that you're not crazy, um, and then. Um, which is uh, which doesn't mean that makes it easier because somehow the legal gender recognition is tied to medical transitioning so it is not accessible for everybody especially for those that do not want to undergo a surgical um um uh transition um so a lot, a lot of people are struggling. A lot of people find themselves looking into the mirror and being someone that they are, but looking into their papers and that does not correspond. Um, also the way our papers are made are very complicated with a social number, which one can never change. And in the social, social number, you have the gender designated, which is one for male, two for female. Also, it brings into question why male one, wh whatever, you know. Um, and regardless of gender recognition, this number will never change. So it, it kind of produces discrepancy and also, um, also issues with a police, with border police, because then the documents seem fake. Um, for example, um, However, just really, really quick, um, also tied into, you know, Hungarian politics of like, um, reducing, um, awareness and access to education, um, there is a law, uh, um, a legislation uh, project, which is called um, Educated Romania, uh, which kind of proposes a series of reforms into the educational system, um, amongst others, is, uh, um, you know, um, goes against uh, discrimination in any kind of educational uh, environment um it goes um it kind of obliges um uh teachers to acknowledge diversity um um sexual and 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 gender diversity into their classes um all in all, it sounds like a beautiful educational uh, uh, project, right? But of course, that comes with a lot of um, um, well, a lot of opinions, and mostly on the side of the of the Orthodox Church, which um, is very much tied into our politics. Um, um, so we had this um, 13 cults and uh, together with uh, recognized cults, religious cults in Romania with Orthodox Church kind of writing a, a letter to the education a minister, um, you know, and doing their church thing, being like, this is an abomination. So I, um, I actually have a picture of this man that represent the, 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 the church and I wanted to kind of like show it to you. Uh, we don't have time. Okay. Well, I'm just going to give you my phone and uh, hopefully, hopefully at some point is going to come back to me. Um, 
but oh there's an echo here in general i think uh, there's also good good uh, things happening and uh, um <laughs> When you look at the Hungarian situation, um, and I apologize for this, it's uh, we're not there yet, and um, I really, you know, I love the the activists in Romania for doing such a great work of resistance and making sure that we will not get there. As we speak, there is a protest happening in front of the government, exactly to protest this, uh, you know, this absurd religious. Uh, um, you know, protest against reforming educational law. Okay. <laughs> you managed. Uh, yeah, because we need, like, we must finish at five and leave this room. And we have so much to talk about. I would like you to talk briefly, really briefly, Harvey and Elias, about the situation in Belgium and the social rights and the U.S. And Uganda, as what we found out a couple of days ago, what happened. Uh, we'll then move to Anita to speak for three minutes about uh, the influence of Russia on Central Asia, and we'll finish with with you. Oh, go. It's a very ambitious. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. I, sure. Okay, I'm gonna go as as quickly as possible. Um, I will say I live in the blessed Valhalla for. Um, queer and trans people, Berlin, where there is some stuff in the um, in the government that is not great, but generally like our healthcare system in terms of at least binary trans rights is pretty good and I can walk around the street wearing whatever I want and usually only be marginally harassed. So um, it is the first place I have ever lived and experienced this. Um, it, it, this is not the case in my country of origin, which is the USA, where there are 429 anti-LGBTQ laws um, on the table that have either passed or are looking like they will pass, mostly targeting trans people, and among that, mostly targeting trans women, because as we all know, trans men don't really exist, except on TV and the movies, and even then, like, not very much. But, uh, yeah, it, this is bullshit. Um, it, only five states and the territory of Puerto Rico have no anti-trans legislature on the table. Um, otherwise, even, like, California has some anti-trans le legislature that will probably pass. Um, anti-trans laws in the USA range from things like binary gender systems in locker rooms when minors are present to criminalizing drag performances. How scary. Uh, gender reaffirming healthcare and um, banning any sort of mention of trans people from public schools. Mm hmm. So great, USA. Uh, the situation is even worse in Uganda, where did you know there are no trans people at all, at least according to the government uh, that just passed this horrible, horrible law, where basically what they see is they don't see trans, they just see gay. And for this, um, you can basically go to jail for 10 years. Um, marriage, if you participate in any way in the marriage of same-sex couples or um, promote homosexuality at all, you know, by like giving someone a place to stay or mentioning that queer people should have rights. Uh, also, you can go to jail. Um, and if you practice homosexual behavior that includes searching for things on the internet, like maybe even information and grinder, forget about it, um, then that's like 10 years of imprisonment for like just basically being... Um, yourself. Yeah, it's really terrible. And I am trying to like, raise a lot of awareness about this, uh, and and get some people I know there, some help. Um, so yeah, and I think my time is up. Um, so I have, I'm trying to come up a way um, on how to start this because in Belgium we have the legal stuff done. We've we've been one of the first countries to legalize gay marriage. Um, if you want to have a binary um, trans transition, it's uh, possible legally. 
medically, even though medically there is a very, very long waiting list. If you want to start hormones, you have to wait at least uh, a year and a half or maybe two years, and you have to be on hormones for one year if you want to do surgeries. So uh, it takes a while, but it's there. Um, the problem is that these anti-trans laws and anti-drag sentiment from the USA is also flying over to Belgium. Belgium is very much uh, inspired by the USA sometimes. Same with the UK, where anti-trans sentiment is very present. Um, so what's happening right now in the politics is that uh, instead of being outright transphobic, they are masking it as being anti-woke. So, uh, for example, um, right now there were some portraits in a city hall um, with very diverse people and they got taken down because the city of Antwerp uh, is conservative and they saw the portraits as being too woke. But it was literally just pictures. Um, and also the anti-drag sentiment and the anti-gender movement, uh, not in the way that it is in Central Asia, but the way that it is in the USA. Uh, is happening right now, as in literally yesterday, there was a news article of a very famous politician who came to a drag show uh, who was like, drag is pedophilia, transgender people is pedophilia. Um, so they are masking it because they know that in general, Belgium has accepted gayness, is accepting transness, um, but it's sneaking its way into our system, even though we are like the Gay Walhalla, uh, a side firm, Berlin maybe. Um, so that raises, yeah, there could be more than one, but it raises concern. And um, then what I wanted to talk about also was that in queer spaces, there is a lot of infighting. Uh, and that's what I um, think is very important that we look out also at ourselves uh, because inside the queer spaces that are very accepting and woo, hippie, we love each other, love is love. Um, there is a lot of anti-trans sentiment and a lot of racism going on. Uh, so I would also like, like to ask everyone to do self-reflection and see how that impacts your vision and your activism. Um, so yeah. I'm, I also want to finish on a good note uh, because it, is, it has been a very negative panel. Um, but I've been doing youth work and I've been meeting kids and there are a lot of kids in Belgium who are raised, being raised in like good families and like they are happy and they are starting their gender surgery and their gender discovery very young. And it's... Uh, it gave give me a lot of hope when I was doing my internship to just see these young kids who weren't aware yet that the world will be very harsh, um, but that they were just like living their lives. So yeah, it is possible. Yeah. Yes, thank you. My inner self is just shaking now and I'm full of emotions. No, 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 no. Thank you. Uh, so do you have my presentation? Okay, 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 um, like, I wanted to emphasize that Russia uh, is not, uh, no, uh, I wanted to emphasize that Russia is not uh, the monolithic state uh, itself, it's like Russia slash federation so we have for example chechnya which is just a very nationalist uh, state in, in in russia in yes inside russia and um i i, I i've had uh, some and uh kadirov uh, this uh, leader of chechnya said that there, that there is no pedophilia, no gay people, no homo, homo, 
what you said, sexualism here, so we're just normal people, he said. And uh, Putin, um, Putin um, joked about uh, transformers and transgender people, he doesn't understand what it is. Yes, um, if you're a transgender uh, person in Russia, you can't get married, married uh, if you're in marriage now, and you um, make your transition, so then you will be divorced, like, forcefully uh, by the government. And so there's very high level of uh, violence. I'm from Russia, I know, I was beaten and all of the stuff. Yes, so that's all, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, like, we'll, uh, we'll get to the better part, like, uh, I would just like Anita, like one, two sentences on the impact on Central Asia, because I think like we not staying only in the Western part and Central part, and then we'll take a short breathing break. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, um, there's no secret that the current situation with translates in the region is really concerning, and uh, there are several reasons for that. Uh, there is strong traditionalist, conservative, or ultra-religious sentiment across the region, and in countries with traditionalist governments, um, the influence of orthodox religions, transphobia also grows, and uh, this trend is common throughout the world, uh, not only in our region. Most of the countries here have close connections with Russia, it's true, economically or politically, and uh, they share many homophobic and transphobic views and practices. Uh, for example, um, a banishment of genes uh, from LGBT person. This particular kind of uh, conversion therapy uh, is widely known in Central Asia and in um, Russian Northern Caucasus. Uh, and anti-gender movements uh, often adopt practices from Russia, for example, in the form of parental committees who just worry about children. And um, in some cases, they are also financed from Russia, who uses the export of home and transphobia as part of its soft power, uh, especially after the beginning of war with Ukraine. Often the repressive laws in Russia are the source of inspiration for its neighbors, and um, not only on LGBT topics, but in general. For example, after the 2013 uh, Russian law banning LGBT propaganda among minors, similar laws were discussed in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, and we assume that the 20 22 law banning all LGBT propaganda in Russia, it will be the reference point for anti-gender movements across the region. Nevertheless, I wouldn't say the influence of Russia is what defines transphobic tendencies in the region. Sometimes it's more like mutual influences. I'd like to provide an example. Um, actually, it was not Russian citizens, but transgender sex workers from Central Asia who were the first to be fined for violating the propaganda law. We know of at least 10 cases uh, when the police considered their advertisement an um, LGBT propaganda and they were fined and uh, reported, uh, deported to their home countries from which they ran before and um, their local police prosecute them too. Right now, police in Russia are raiding on transgender sex workers, racially profiling them and targeting those who look like Asians. And um, because they're very easy targets, they could be fined for violations of the immigration law, um, sex work, and now for LGBT propaganda as well. I guess uh, this case shows us um, that transphobia goes hand in hand with other kinds of oppression and eventually becomes a common interest of authoritative, authoritative regimes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you also for the work that you're doing for the for the region to support. Uh, I would like to propose that we have a two minute of breathing exercise to settle down because like we've been talking about such concerning, graving and sad. Um, okay. I was just looking at Monica no? <laughs> some more. <the, the laughs> And she was reminded all of a sudden, I guess she was posting or doing something and then all of a sudden she was reminded to breathe and she was like. <laughs> <laughs> and there we go there we go you know we had this meeting last week and we we're talking what are we gonna do you know this is going to be so stressful we're all invited here to cry on like how bad it is in our countries uh you know we need to shift a bit and then we said well let's do like a collective um breathing you know even though um 
you might think, well, this is not about us. You know, we Polish people, look how accomplished we are. We're literally hosting the first uh, uh, trans conference and events, the first national, how would you translate? The National Day of Polish Trans Visibility. Uh, you know, so it's like you might think it's not about us, but it is also about you because what you what you do here by also staying in this room, you you show solidarity and you show support with us and with the countries which we represent, also with with the people on the screen. Um, so you know, I, I do like to 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 say thank you very often to those that listen and because I think those that listen are just as important um, like those that do that they're like you know in in this context so in order to do that uh, we thought <coughs> that we get everybody up uh, crazy right <laughs> this is crazy um, just really simple because also I see that we're losing you and we're gonna shake our body Shake it, shake it, shake your body. Shake exactly. it like a Polaroid picture. <laughs> yes. Shake everything you got, everything your mamas gave you. Okay. And now we're gonna close our eyes. Close your eyes. And try to, to find a sense of like inner balance. Try try to try to to balance yourself. Maybe observe and don't judge. Where are you right now? Are you tired? Close your eyes. Are you energized? Uh, are you bored? Uh, are you confused of what's happening? Find that, find whatever defines you in this moment in time. Yeah, the walls are collapsing because this has never <laughs> been done in such a context. Um, it's okay, we're, okay. So once you found that, we're gonna, we're gonna take Three very deep, deep breaths. So let's do it together. And release a bit of that anxiety or whatever it is. And again. And release even a bit more and one more time. And I also invite for those that are on the Zoom uh, meeting to do the same thing, you know. And uh, you keep your eyes closed and we try to perhaps use a bit of a mantra or a sentence to balance ourselves. And um, I don't know, usually you would say, um, I am beautiful. I am worthy of love and peace and balance. Yes, Tim. Yes, Tim. Piękne. E, zas nie, ja I deserve. Ach, tak. E, jestem wad, wata, warte miłości, równowagi i wewnętrznego spokoju, pokoju. Pokoju. And once you put that, we breathe one more time. We release. We open our eyes. With a big smile, we look at each other and we're like, you know, we took that moment and I thank you very much for that. It's, we did nothing complicated. We just stopped. Okay, thank you. We're together. And thank you, thank you so much for being together in it uh, and sharing also your love and peace and the energy in the room. Uh, as uh, you paid attention late, earlier on, uh, Kat, to the good things, like to things that bring us joy, that like things that we need to celebrate as Budapest Pride and different stuff. I would like you to shortly, like really in one sentence, because I would like really to give the floor also to some questions in this 18 minutes we have left. Just in one sentence, what's the joy? What is the tool that you use in your work for healing that is revolutionary that that you bring yeah. from the other. Yeah. 
hard to say for me right now because I'm very emotional right now. Um, well, I I also have to think of something, but I think being queer is being art, and art is beautiful. I have three sentences. I'm just gonna do it. Sorry. Also, I want to say thank you, Monica, for having me here. Um, I didn't say so in the beginning because I was nervous and staring at my notes. So, um, yeah. Um, so, I want to say trans people are beautiful and people are afraid of us because we know who we are. Our transness can't be taken away from us. As much as they try to erase us, we will continue to rise and thrive. And this is what I tell myself when I find it difficult to get out of bed in the morning after like stupid shit happens to me on the street or I have a friend uh, tell me about something that happened to him her, or them that day that made them feel shitty about themselves. Uh, this is what I tell to them, but I think we all need to remember that as much as the media tries to tell us that we don't exist and erase us or tell us that we exist, but our lives are also tragic, like, yeah, some things are difficult, but that is bullshit because we also can be really funny. We are lovable and we, we deserve, we deserve to love our thing, uh, ourselves and we deserve to have other people love us. What I want to share is uh, another piece of my brother's story. Uh, although legal gender recognition is not possible in Hungary and thus um, he he cannot change his name and, and gender, uh, the medical transitioning is, is possible. So ju there's just a few doctors in Hungary. Um, I actually only know one, but there's more, um, who is helping trans people to, to medically transition. So my brother had a top surgery and is doing a, a hormone therapy taking testosterone. So that's something that gives me hope and, and keeps me positive. Mm, so as I said, I work a lot with performing arts um, and, and, and theater in communities as a way to uh, somehow kickstart that healing process that every community has to go through. You know, we are deeply traumatized and if we are not traumatized as a generation, there is always intergenerational trauma, which our bodies and our, uh, our collective body and our collective mind brings through. Um, so this is what kind of like my practice also centers a lot uh, around like somatic healing and 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 intra community um healing and also uh you know i am i am living proof that uh, this movement this movement of healing is a truly intersectional one as a, you know as as a trans roma a person that faces also different different oppressions which i will not name here cuz we don't want to get sappy uh, again um <clears throat> I'm living proof that we matter as also non-white, uh, non-white uh, bodies and that we should be uh, respected and also uplifted inside of the communities because as Elias was saying, there is a lot of divide inside of each community and it's, um, it's always, you know, neurodivergent people or people of color, um, that, find themselves at the forefront of the fights that that uh, we, we we are going through um so yeah that's it and also you know i'm i'm dropped it gorgeous so i think that's also a thing that i bring to the table um thank you not to miss you on zoom like anita would like to share any sentence of like what brings like what you do to bring the joy the fun the strength resilience well, the inspiration have personal contacts with many people and trans activists across the region, and I guess um, these contacts, these relationships with people like us, is the best source of power, of inspiration, and of joy. And I guess we need it more often. Thank you so much. So I would like to ask if there are any questions in the room that can be answered. Okay.
Okay, it works. Um, first of all, I want to say you all look fabulous today. Uh, first of all. <laughs> Uh, and my question is, as a Polish citizen, I am following a lot of things that happen internationally with trans people and overall queer communities. And I want to ask um, if there are any, like, if there is a petition, because I'm aware of the international petitions and inner country petitions, but it, as a Polish citizen, can I, for example, sign under, for example, U USA petitions where there are really, um, there are many of them, to prevent those trans, anti-trans uh, bills to come to life. So as a Polish citizenship, can I like write under some documents or like, you know, petitions? Um, because I don't know if it's possible for non um, particular country citizens. Can I do that? Basically, that's my question. Um, honestly, I don't know because, well, A, I have not lived in the US for 12 years and I I didn't like actually think about this but I would say I think you could find out if you uh, went to the I'm sure there is an American consulate here and I think that you could probably even just send them an email and ask them and they could they could tell you yeah Well, I think that's, uh, yeah, a bit, a bit, uh, but, uh, you know, I know as far as online petitions go, of course, uh, um, you can, uh, because especially when it comes to trans rights, you know, trans rights are universal rights, you know, um, and it's an absolute valid uh, signature. You are a citizen of this planet, you know, in the end. I mean, I don't want to sound too bombastic about it, uh, but I always sign petitions, online petitions, the ones that I, I believe in, uh, because it is so important, you know, you put your name in there, it, 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 it adds. There is strength in, in numbers, you know, I don't like statistics uh, that much, uh, but there is strength in, in uh, so if, if, you're talking about online petitions. Yes, it is absolutely possible that you, as a Polish national, you can you can partake. And also, we are living in most of the countries are very bureaucratic and they don't check mostly. So, like, it's it names are names. Lie, lie, lie. 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 Yeah, lie. exactly. Yeah. Like, say you have an address. No, no one cares. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, just just look up an address and like that's the the space that you can allow yourself to 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 do that and also just like um follow uh, try to follow movements uh on social media pages uh the right ones of course uh, no the left ones but uh, yeah uh and then try to see if they have collaborations with other countries and that way you can discover um like national movements and they will mostly on their english pages or like the international pages that they have they will share the petitions that everyone can can share. So I think if we have uh, petitions that are mostly national, um, they will be shared like in those pages and then international ones. Yeah. Sorry, I thought of something. So there is also there is a podcast about uh, there. It's called the Anti-Trans Hate Machine. They're coming out with season two. It's um, by a journalist podcaster named Imara Jones. She is a trans woman of color, um, and you can follow this podcast on Instagram or any other platform. Uh, listen to it where you get your podcasts. It's again, it's called the Anti-Trans Hate Machine. It's all about the anti-trans laws that are going on in the USA from a black trans perspective. And I am sure she gets so much hate mail. So if you just wanted to like find her on Insta and send her a message of support and tell you you are listening from Poland, like that would probably mean a lot to just keeping her going. I sure really will, and thank you for your answers. It helped me a lot. Thank you. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. That's it. No, no That's more it. questions. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Also, we are just normal people, so we will be outside and talk to us. Yeah. Yes. Speak for yourself. Or I mean, not. Made okay. Glitter. Well, I am not normal, but I am just a person, so just yeah. talk to me. Yeah.
Yeah? And that's the last panel of today. Like we go to demonstration together, I hope. Thank you so much to all on Zoom that you've been with us, that you joined us. So thank you. See you soon at the party, at the demo. We can talk later on. And Monica. Um, organizational stuff. Uh, uh, the protest is taking place in one and a half an hour from now. So you can grab some food or um, chill or or whatever. Uh, and the uh, Platz Wolności, the, the Freedom Square, is like five minutes walk from here, so it's really close. Uh, so I invite you all. Uh, but I want to, I would like to uh, thank you so much, all of you, also on Zoom, and all of you physical in your bodies, your beautiful bodies, uh, which are. Um, emanation of your beautiful souls uh, for coming, for taking trip, for being with us and for uh, your solidarity with us and for the solidarity we all share with each other. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And I would like also to, to say big, big thank you to all the technical team because they made an amazing job. <laughs> You know, we are NGO, so we we do not have money, we do not have equipment, but uh, we have spirits and the team of, of Lambda and team of uh, Zamek, the castle. Uh, they were amazing. We like stop. We finished working at four or something like this, four a.m. today. Uh, so thank you all. Thank Wukash for for hosting the the panels, and uh, there are so many people who put their commitment to that all of this happened today. Uh, so I thank you all. I thank them all. Mm, I'm not sure I should mention him, but but the, the, the inspiration actually was this fucked up guy uh, who is a leader of, of ruling party. I won't say uh, loud his name because there are minors around, so maybe they, they shouldn't hear bad words. And when he said um, something like this last year that, oh, uh, half minute, uh, half an hour ago, I was uh, a guy, but now I'm a young woman. I thought, I will do something about it. And this is the something, yeah? So we greet you. <laughs> I hope he will rot in jail this year. Um, we are born this way, as we are. And nobody's going to tell us who we are. And this is the most beautiful thing of all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's thank Monica, who oh, initiated Monica. all of this, and she would never. She wouldn't, but I will. Like this is the person who initiated all of it, who invited all of us to join like this adventure, like never, like in three months, <laughs> like we did it, like we're still ahead. But really like thank you from all our hearts because we wouldn't be here. Like we wouldn't have this day without you. Hello. <laughs> Alone, I wouldn't do anything. Thank you. So, thank you so much. See you at the uh, Solidarity Square. Platz Wolności, Freedom Square. <laughs>